Yeah. <laughs> you like that? Is that a good video? Excellent. Yeah, so thanks to Lauren for making that little new... Now, just so you know, that's not an official new gra- uh, logo for Reality Church. It's just for this series, though uh, we may change it in the future. We'll see. Anyway, good morning, everybody. Thank you for being here. In case you didn't catch it, my name is Daniel, and I'm the pastor here. And what we're launching into today... It's called Reality 2.0, and I just want to catch you up in case you haven't been here, you're, you're maybe you're new, or you didn't, you've been gone for a little while. Um, how this came about is that about, I guess in January, January 15th, I actually know the date, um, I had a lunch <laughs> date with Steve Saleo, who is the pastor we just said goodbye to, and he dropped the bomb on me <laughs> that he was uh, feeling called to move to Florida and he wanted me to take over the church. And I'll tell you, at the moment, I was completely speechless. <laughs> and I didn't sleep for about three days, just so you know. But um, uh, after a lot of prayer and a lot of uh, counsel with others, uh, I knew uh, right away, very quickly, that yes, this is indeed what God has for my life and for this church. And one of the ways I knew that, that a friend told me, is that he said, I asked him, how do you know? How do you know? How do I know that I'm supposed to do this? I mean, it seemed like a no-brainer. I've been with the church for a long time. I left for a little while, which is a story for another time. Um, nothing bad. But the question was, how do I know this is what I'm supposed to do? It's what I want to do. It sounds cool. And I'll, but he said, if God's given you a vision, if God's given you what you would do with this church, if it was yours, different than what maybe Steve had, then it's yours. If you have no idea what you're going to do, then it's not for you. And I was like, you know, he absolutely has given me. And I, t- I tell you what, about day three when I was, hadn't slept in a few days, so maybe that's why it's a little crazy, but <laughs> day three, while well, I hadn't slept in about three days, is when I, the thing I'm going to share with you for the next five weeks, this week plus four more, all came at like one time, this one big picture of where it is we are going as a church. And so this series, Reality 2.0, is a glimpse into the not yet achieved future, but what's coming up and what we're going to become. And today's talk is specifically about the vision, the vision. Now, Bill Hybels, he describes, he defines vision as a picture of the future that creates passion in people, a picture of the future that creates passion in people. And today I want to share with you that vision that God has given me, and it definitely has created passion inside of me, I, I, so much that I get chills. In fact, right now, as I'm about to tell it to you, I get goosebumps, I get chills, I get uh, my heart start racing, and sometimes I even tear up and maybe even break down trying, crying because it's a vision, it's a picture of the future in my head that I want to put in your head of the future that produces passion in me, and I hope that it produces passion in you as well. Um, so, like I said, I've shared this vision with many of you on a personal level. You've gotten to hear kind of the short, uh, you know, coffee talk uh, version of it. But today and over the next several weeks, I'm going to explain it in hopefully not excruciating, but in thorough detail. Vision is the uh, answer to the question, what are we doing? Or what are we aiming for? What's the ultimate big picture overall goal of the church. After today and the next two weeks, I'm going to be discussing the mission of the church. The mission is how it is we're going to accomplish said vision. And I created this little graphic that I drew on a whiteboard, but Patty did an awesome job of making it look. Can you bring that up? Yeah, like that. And I, I have this, you don't, there's no words in it yet because it, this is kind of how I envision it. In a minute, I'm going to show you what's on the signs and stuff like that. But the, the, the vision is where we're going. The mission is the kind of like the two lanes of the road of how we're going to get there. And then the following couple of weeks, I'm going to discuss the core values, as in what are we going to be like? What's our personality? In, in, the, in, the, in the sign, it's kind of like speed limit signs. It, it gives us the how it is we're going to go down this path. So I hope and pray that you will be here all five weeks. If you miss any week or if you're in the children's program, make sure you catch it online because you're not going to want to miss what it is I'm talking about this week and the following weeks. Now, uh, before I get into the thick of things and start getting all worked up, (laughs) I need to do something that may help you hear better what it is I'm saying. You see, what I'm about to unfold to you today may just happen... Just like it did me, it might produce some feelings 
inside of you. It might cause you to get chills or something like that or goosebumps. You might feel compelled to respond. And I want to give you permission to actually do that. In fact, in many churches, it's almost expected that everyone in the church claps, hoots, and hollers, and shouts hallelujah about everything the preacher says. I know we're not quite like that, but I want to give you permission today, since what I'm going to be talking about may stir some of your heartstrings. I want to give you a chance to respond in like kind. So we're going to do a little bit of practice just to get you warmed up, okay? You ready for this? So let, let's, let's, so if so, if so say, say the Redskins just scored a touchdown. Oh, okay. Well, all right. Your favorite team, your favorite team. They just scored a touchdown. Woohoo! Yeah! Yeah! All right. Now, and maybe I said something that you're like, oh, yeah, yeah, yeah. So let's practice the yeah! Yeah! yeah. Or like, amen, brother! Amen. Hallelujah. Hallelujah! All right. That might be a little much, much for us, but you get the picture. Feel free to respond. It makes me feel better, just so you know. I like it when you because I can't really see you. I can't see that you're nodding vigorously. You're shaking your head, except for like a couple of you. But feel free to respond, clapping, whatever else like that. And if, if you don't, I'm really going to feel lonely up here. Just, hey, there we go. We got one. <laughs> Excellent. Okay, all right. Um, moving on. Uh, now, before I come out and actually say specifically what the vision is, vision is I want to set it up for you by telling you a few stories. And the first story comes from the Bible. And in fact, our graphic in a second, you'll see that the Bible is foundational. In fact, it's, we are grounded. Go ahead and show that. We are grounded. That is one of the keys to being able to do what we do. We are grounded in God's Word because without it, we wouldn't have a road. We wouldn't have road signs. We wouldn't have speed limit signs. We wouldn't have anything if we did not have God's Word to direct us, inspire us, teach us, correct us, and all those things. So we will be, there we go. I got an amen. Excellent. Everyone else? Amen? Anyone? Any, uh, okay. All right. We'll get there. I'll get you. <laughs> it's good. Good practice. I like that. Okay. So we will be a church, first and foremost, before we go anywhere, a church that is grounded in God's Word. Everything that we do will be based and filtered through this book. All right. So the story I want to tell you is from John chapter 9. John chapter 9. It's a book of the Bible uh, that a guy named John wrote. And it's the story of Jesus healing a blind man. So follow along with me on the screens or in your Bibles. It's John 9, starting in verse 1. It says, As Jesus was walking along, he saw a man who had been born blind, who had been blind from birth. Rabbi, his disciples asked him, why was this man born blind? Was it because of his own sins or his parents' sins? It was not because of his sins or his parents' sins, Jesus answered. This happened so the power of God could be seen in him. We must quickly carry out the tasks assigned to us by the one who sent us. The night is coming, and then no one can work. And while I am here in the world, I am the light of the world. Then he spit on the ground and made mud with the saliva and spread the mud over the blind man's eyes. He told him, go, wash yourself in the pool of Siloam, which Siloam means sent. So the man went and washed and came back and seeing. He could see now. His neighbors and others who knew him as a blind beggar asked each other, isn't this the man who used to sit and beg? Some said he was, and others said, no, he just looks like, look, look, looks like him. But the beggar kept saying, yes, I, I am the one. I'm the same one. And so they asked him, who healed you? What happened? And he told them, well, the man they called Jesus made mud, and he spread it over my eyes and told me, go to the pool of Siloam and wash yourself. And so I went and washed, and now I could see. Well, where is he now, they asked. Well, I don't know, he replied. Remember, he probably didn't know what he looked like because he was blind when they met, that kind of thing. Anyway. Then they took the man who had been blind to the Pharisees. These are the religious leaders, the, 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 the guys that were in control, the bosses of they were religious society and all that. Because, and so because it was on the Sabbath that Jesus had made the mud and healed him, which Sabbath, I'll talk about it another time, was a day that you weren't supposed to do anything. Like you couldn't even like pick up your water to drink kind of like ridiculous rules. And so Jesus liked healing people on the Sabbath just to kind of be like, you guys don't get it. Anyway, so side note. All right, so where was I? Okay, the Jesus made the mud and healed. The Pharisees asked the man all about it, and so he told them, he put on the mud over my eyes, and when I washed it, I could see. All right, so some of the Pharisees says, this man, Jesus, is not from God, for he is working on the Sabbath. How could he do that? Others said, but how could an ordinary sinner do such miraculous signs? So there was a deep division of opinion among them. So some of them had sense. It's like, oh, if he wasn't from God, how could he make a blind man see? They're like, nobody did it on the Sabbath. You can't do that. So then the Pharisees again questioned the man. So they asked him again, who had been blind and demanded, what's your opinion about this man? Who healed you? The man replied, I think he must be a prophet. Makes sense. The Jewish leaders still refused to believe the man had been blind. They refused to believe the man had been blind. 
So first they couldn't believe Jesus actually healed him, so now they're saying he wasn't blind. So they, they refused to believe the man had been blind and could now see, so they called in his parents. They asked them, is this your son? Was he born blind? If so, how can he see? His parents replied, we know this is our son and that he was born blind, but we do not know how he can see or who healed him. Ask him. He's old enough to speak for himself. His parents said this because they were afraid of the Jewish leaders who had announced that anyone saying Jesus was the Messiah would be expelled from the synagogue, which is a very bad thing. And that's why they said he is old enough. Ask him. So for the second time, they called in the man who had been blind and told him, God should get the glory for this because we know this man, Jesus, is a sinner. I don't know whether he is a sinner, the man replied, but I know this. I was blind, and now I can see. I love that, love that, love that. And yes, the story continues a little bit more, and the Pharisees are badgering him some more, and they eventually get mad at him, start throwing mud at him, and, well, actually, they call him names and stuff, and they throw him out. But what a story. A man who was blind his whole life, Probably 30-something years. His whole life he could not see. He was blind. He was a beggar in the streets. Because back in those days, they didn't have Braille and things like they have today. A blind man was basically a beggar, a useless person. Now suddenly he has an encounter with Jesus and he can see. Whoa. Now, there are many stories like this. Many about Jesus healing people in the Bible. But have you ever thought about, for instance, this blind man or some others that he healed? What about a year later? What about two years later? five or ten. What was their life like then? We tend to read these stories. They make for good coloring book pictures, and we know the one story healed the lame person, this, that, and the other. But do you ever think about their life after, down the road, a little bit further on? Do you think that, for instance, uh, the blind man, that he went back to his normal life, begging on the side of the street, only now he could see when people gave him money? Or take, for instance, the lame people, those that could not walk, that Jesus made to walk. Do you think they still had their friends carry them around on the mat? Do you think they still laid around begging people to give them money? Or do you think perhaps a few years later their lives no longer even resembled what it was before? Or what about the lepers that he healed, the people that were covered in sores, who were outcasts of society? He made them whole. They could come back. Do you think they went back and hung out with all the lepers anymore? Do you think they kept doing the same old thing? No, 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 no. What about the people that he cast demons out of? Again, they were out in the outcast. They were not not in their right minds. Now they could think and see clearly. They could go back to their family. They could have a new life. And what about the people he brought back to life, like Lazarus, who was dead? Do you think he went back to sleeping in the tomb? You think he put all the little strips of linen back on? so that No, 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 no. It wasn't just like a, a healing of a little scrape or a bruise or something. It was so much more. Are you noticing a pattern here? Are you noticing what I'm getting at? Jesus was not just in the business of motivational speaking and healing people's physical infirmities. What he did for these people changed their entire life. Every aspect of their life. When you're a blind person or a lame person, that defines who you are. And Jesus said, no, 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 no. Let me restore this. And it changed everything about their life. Jesus was not just in the business of healing a few scrapes and bruises. And he didn't just do this when healing people. If you know the story about the woman at the well who came and he told her his whole life and he he said, you're drinking this water, you're going to come back here all the time, but I give you the living water. Do you think she kept doing the same thing? Now that she had the living water, no, 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 no. And look at the disciples. Oh, the disciples. Peter, James, and John were stinky fishermen, smelly. Matthew, the guy who wrote one of the books of the New Testament, was a dirty cheat tax collector, hated by everybody. And the others weren't much better off. But when they, and they were also huge cowards. When Jesus got arrested, they all split. But then all of a sudden, when they had an encounter with the risen Christ, they suddenly came back and they were so courageous, spreading the word of God that it started a movement that's lasted for 2,000 years. And we are a result of that. Something happened in their life. And look at Paul. The apostle Paul, who wrote most of the New Testament, started out as the hate-breathing murderer of Christians. He wanted to kill them all. They were all messed up. They're, they're, they're violating our law. And he had an encounter with the risen Christ, made him blind, and suddenly he became the self-sacrificing, people-loving missionary that spread the gospel all over the, mo- the modern world at the time, wrote half the New Testament, and we are a result of his efforts today. It's amazing. Are you noticing a pattern here? Are you noticing what's going on here? 
He was not just in the business of healing a few sicknesses. He was not just in the business of motivational speaking. He fundamentally changes people's lives, and he's still doing it today. He fundamentally changes lives, and he's still doing it today. And I'll tell you this, I am living proof. The person standing here in front of you, I was just less than 10 years ago. The people that knew me in the Navy would laugh if they knew I was a pastor right now. I guarantee you that. I was angry. I was jealous. I was greedy. I was depraved. I was depressed. I was lonely. I was an arrogant loser, and I had no true purpose in my life. And there's much more. There's worse. And I found myself in the belly of a submarine at the end of my emotional, spiritual, and mental rope. And I had an encounter with the risen Christ. And I tell you, he changed me from the inside. He changed me fundamentally. I am not the same. I am a new creation. And there is no other explanation. There is, there's no amount of self-help books, no amount of counseling I could get, no amount of psychologists I can get. I had an encounter with the living Christ, and he flooded me with his spirit, and I am a new man today. I am not the same. This has happened to thousands of people through the years. This has happened to many of you in the seats. Your life has been fundamentally changed, and there's no other explanation. It's because the only answer is Jesus, who doesn't leave us where we are, but he makes us whole, and he makes us new. That's a good thing to clap about. I'm going to teach you how to do this eventually. You're right. <laughs> All right. So that's my story. And there's a whole lot of some of you that know me. Man, I've had a road. I, I can't even explain to you. Most of you, this is the first time you've met me, but you don't know. And the same for you. I know that you and your seats, you've perhaps experienced the same kind of, I used to be this, but now I'm this. And there's only one explanation. And don't just take my word for it. In fact, I was able to convince three, no, four very brave people to actually give their story on video in an interview. So I want you to see their stories about how Christ has changed their life. You can watch that here. The life before we became Christians was more like day to day. You wake up, you go to work, you have breakfast, you go to work, you come home, we should pull, go to bed, wake up, do it all over again. And it was just the same routine of repeating the same cycle. You do it over and over again. There is no spirituality behind it. You have friends and you have your job and you have home and we had each other. But ever since we got baptized and we joined reality, it feels like the friends that we have met there are not friends anymore. They're our family. Reality is not just a church, it's a home for us, and it's our relationship. We have never been closer than now. Our marriage has taken a whole new meaning. We have become much closer together. I love him more now than I ever have, and the way I feel towards other people is different, and I love being surrounded by other Christians. Before I was bitter, you know, I was. Uh life was plain, you know, uh, all I cared about was me, you know, I was greedy, I, I, I want people to love me, I want people to do things for me, I want people to respect me, I want, I want, but when I didn't even know how to respect myself, I didn't even love myself, you know, um, and that's why I learned about reality, um, it's awesome, man, like, I learned how to love people. You know, I learned how to respect people. And every Sunday that I sit there, it was cleansing my soul. Every Sunday, you know, it was, it was, it was powerful, man. So um, I learned how to love every day. It's, it's, it's awesome because, you know, when, when you know how to love someone, when you know how to love people, now I'm not just talking about your brother, your sister, your family members, or whatever. When you learn how to love your neighbors, your friends, you know, everybody around you, when you learn how to love, um, you don't have to make them love you back. You don't have to make them respect you. And that's the amazing part, man. They, they will automatically love you back, you know? And um, that's God at work. That's definitely God at work. This is the amazing part. You know, another thing about being Christian that 
occurred to me is that, you know, at some point you realize that the things that were important to you before are not as important anymore. And the things that you have never known even existed is what is on top of your list and what matters to you the most. You know, Christianity has filled a void in me that I didn't know was there. And, you know, it's just your values are completely different now. Before accepting Christ into my life, it was, life was, was difficult. You know, I thought I was a good person, but I look back and I really wasn't. Um, you, you, you know, you think you're not committing sin, but um, I really was. And um, now my conscience is developed. I know right and wrong, and I lean towards the right. Whereas before, um, I did have a conscience, but it, it wasn't speaking to me. It wasn't there to tell me what right and wrong was. It didn't lead me in the right direction. I acted, and I made poor decisions, um, and I made the wrong choices a lot. And I just, and I thought they were the right. And I look back now, and they weren't. And now I'm making better decisions because I have Christ in my life. And I wish back then I would have had him in my life for guidance um, and to make better choices. Life is easier now. Um, I don't feel alone because I'm not alone. I have someone that I can turn to when I'm stressed, when I need to make difficult decisions in my life and I need guidance. My life's really changed um, because how I used to be. I used to be more self-centered. All I cared about was myself and when was I going to be the one being appraised for stuff that, you know, really the stuff I was doing wasn't all that great, you know, but in my eyes it was. Um, and I always thought I could do it on my own, make it on my own. I didn't need help or anything like that. Uh, but then I realized I did need help, you know, that missing piece in my life, that missing part that that yearns for learning and wanting more and knowing that there's a lot more to the world than as we see it. Uh, you know, the atmosphere in my house, and my home has completely changed. Uh, it's grown, I've allowed myself to grow closer to my kids and my daughter. Um, it's a healthier relationship. You know, I live for her and the other, my other two kids instead of myself. I don't put myself first anymore. I've definitely changed internally. I can feel my soul grow. I can feel like it's been touched, and it has been touched by God. As verses that it was all just felt like dark, you know. It, my heart was never lit on fire like it is now. Uh, I'm proud to be a Christian. I'm proud to be around a family that I can call a family and be myself and be happy and smile and <laughs> be relaxed and do things that I enjoy doing, all with the people I care about. Yeah. <clears throat> Hats off to those guys for braving the camera. Thank you. You know, the, the last one there, Jason, he's a, uh, I've gotten to watch him grow, and it's been amazing. That's one of the joys of this position that God's placed me in, is I get to see other people's lives change, not just mine. And here's the thing, is that this is the greatest proof of our faith. All of the apologetics, all of the debates, uh, you know, those things are fine, they're great, but in the end, there's only one thing, only one thing that people cannot argue with you about. They cannot refute, they cannot deny is that your life has fundamentally been changed. It's like the blind man says, I can't answer all of your questions. All I know, all I know is that I was blind and now I can see. I, I can't answer all of your questions about creation, but all I know is that I was lost but now I am found. I was, I was hopeless. I had no hope, but now I have a hope for the future. I used to be condemned, and I felt condemned and put down, but now I know I am redeemed. I am free. I am forgiven. I used to be in chains. I couldn't do anything in my life because of this internal chains that I had, but now I am set free. I used to be in despair. There was no hope in my soul. I was in turmoil all my life, but I, now I have joy, unspeakable. I used to have no peace. No, It was all anxiety, but now I have peace that passes all understandings. I used to be dead in my sins, but now I am alive in Christ Jesus. I can't answer all your questions. I can't explain to you why and how and all that. All I know is I once was this, but now I am this. I once had no purpose in my life, 
Now I have a purpose. Now I have a calling. I have a God-made reason for existing, and it gives me a reason to wake up every morning with a smile on my face. Is there anything better than that? No, there's not. I am not the same. I am a life changed, and there's no other explanation. And I know many of you can say the same thing, and the truth is there's nothing else like it, and you can't get this anywhere else. This is the only place that that kind of life change is found. And here, and that's not even the best part. (laughs) The best part is that he doesn't just change you. He then uses you to change others. He doesn't just change me. He doesn't just leave it at selfish, Daniel, I'm going to change your life. You're going to be awesome. But I'm going to use you to touch other lives. And I tell you what, there is nothing better than getting to sit across from someone and tell them who Jesus is and they say yes to him and you see their life grow. There's nothing better than that. Nothing better than that. He uses people to reach people. And that, my friends, is what the Great Commission is all about. You've heard of the Great Commission in Scripture just before Jesus. You know, he rose from the dead. He's talking to his disciples. He's got the cool glorified body. He's about to ascend into heaven. And then he says in Matthew 28, he says, All authority in heaven and on earth has been given to me. Therefore, go and make disciples. He says some other things, but he says, Go and make disciples. Do what I've been doing for you. Go. Replicate the process. Do the same thing. He uses people to change people. And here's the fact. This is what drives me. This is what was planted in my heart a long time ago, and I put it into words just a few months ago. I am a life changed. And woe to me if I do not give my life in bringing that same life change to others. And maybe some of you are the same people that God has called me to insert that kind of life change. So what is our vision? (laughs) Our vision at Reality 2.0, at Reality Church, from this day forward, is we are a church that is dedicated to seeing lives changed by the transforming, restoring power of Jesus Christ. My friends, it is not about numbers in the seats. It is not about how many conversions or salvations or baptisms or how cool we are or any of that kind of stuff. Although I love seeing people saved and I love seeing people baptized. But if you've been at my church, if you've been at our church for a year or two and you are the same as you were a year or two later, if you are now seeing and you used to be blind but you're still begging by the side of the road, then what has happened? Then we have failed Failed, failed, failed as a church if everyone here is, diff- is not different a year from now, is not exhibiting some of the fruit of the Spirit of love and joy and peace and patience and kindness and such. And I'm not just talking about just a few behavioral changes, like maybe you start giving or you stop cussing or something like that. I'm talking about character changes, the kind of things you can't, you can't try to have joy. You can't try to have peace. You can't You could try to have patience, but you can't do it unless the Spirit is enabling you. And that is the kind of change that only you can get through a relationship with Jesus Christ when His Spirit is dwelling inside of you. We live in a broken world. A broken world. There is so much pain and so much hurt around us and in us. And we hold the only cure in the name of Jesus. Just like the woman, just like Jesus told the woman at the well, look, you can keep coming back here and drinking this water. You're just going to get thirsty again. But he gave her the living water. The living water that makes you never thirst again. And that is what Jesus brings to people. He fundamentally changes your life from the inside out. The world simply cannot provide what only Jesus can give. And we are called. No, we are charged by God, to bring that living water to a thirsty, thirsty people. Go and make disciples. Go and do what I've done for you. Go and change people's lives by the power that I'm going to give you. So the vision of Reality 2.0, the way, the where we are going, the destination on the road sign is that we will be a church that is dedicated to seeing lives changed by the transforming, restoring power of Jesus Christ. In short, we're about seeing lives changed about changed lives. That's the destination on the road sign. That's where we are going. That is our goal. Now, in the next couple of weeks, I'm going to talk about how we're going to do that. It's great to have a big goal like that, but how? How how do we get there? And I believe there's two lanes to that road. We'll be discussing it the next two weeks. Now, 
I'm going to ask the band to come on back up here because I want you to hear a song by a man uh, who has experienced this kind of change. I've seen it in him over the past four years. Andy Fanton, Andrew Fanton, is our sound technician. He's, uh, he's coming up over here on the side, and he's got the band coming up to help him, or at least some of the band, anyway. Um, I don't know what they're doing. Um, anyway, he approached me, I don't know, a month ago, four or five weeks ago, something like that, about performing a song on a Sunday morning. Now, if you ask me, that's a brave, <laughs> brave thing to do. Um, you might not ever want to ask me to do that. I'm just saying. Anyway, he's never done that before. In fact, I've never even heard him sing, so I, I hope he's good. <laughs> but here's the point. It's not about... The reason why I said yes, I said yes right away. It's because it's not about, hey, are you a professional concert singer? Do you have the voice of angels and all that kind of thing? That's not why I'm letting him do this. That's not why I'm asking them to play this song. It's because he is a life changed and he felt compelled to express this story of his about how through it all, this is the song they're singing, God has always been there. And I, wanted to, I want to give him that chance. So if he sings good or not, I don't care. Listen to the words and the story, just like you did for the video, of what God can do in a person when we trust in him. So Andy, take it away. Thank you, Daniel. Um, just to, to give you a little history behind how this song came to be, um, Julie was going to sing a special song for Steve uh, the weekend that they left, and then she changed her mind. But while I was looking for it, I stumbled across th this song through it all. And it really touched me, and I just felt compelled, just like I know Daniel, when he shared with us how he was leaving, that God basically told him he had to do this. Um, I felt that God was calling me to sing this song out of obedience, and I didn't know why. And I was saying, gee, you really want me to sing this song? That means I'm going to have to practice. I'm going to have to try and sing. I hate singing in front of people. I'm going to be nervous and with all this stuff, but I just felt this, this, this compelling need to do it and there were times I was doubting whether or not I should do it and you know back and forth and stuff like that and then uh, I thought about the uh, the picture you see of uh, footprints in the sand and how you know what the impact of that whole uh, past that poem's about and then I was still looking searching and I'm like how am I going to get through this Lord and then I was looking on Facebook and uh, recently at a graduation Denzel Washington spoke for a, a graduating uh, school. And his first three words to the graduating students were, put God first. And then after that, he said, I didn't always stick with him, but he stuck with me. And that's the story of my life, because I know a lot of you out there, uh, it's great with the young Christians who have, you know, you've only been saved for a short time, and you'll have all that energy and all that Wow, I've just been saved and all that stuff. But what about those who have been faithful followers of Christ years and ye years and years? And we have our ups and we have our downs. And we have our good days and we have our bad days. But no matter what happens, he is always there. Yeah, you know, that takes a lot of guts to do that. <laughs> i got to tell you, I've gotten used to being up here, but most people aren't. Um, don't worry, I'll get all of you up here at some point. Thank you, Andy. Seriously, that was a, a blessing, yes. Because <clears throat> it tells the story of why it is our lives can change. It isn't like he just says, all right, poof, you're changed. It's an it's a ups and downs. It's a, it's a win and a loss. But through it all, we have this constant God who never gives up on us, never lets go of us, and he's with us all the time, and that's what Jesus brings. Now, before I finish today, I want to give you a couple of things that this vision is not, just so we're clear. First of all, it is not a prosperity gospel. Change life does not mean you will accomplish the American dream, because that's the American dream, <laughs> not the God's will for your life dream. There's a difference. Jesus said in John chapter 10, verse 10, he says, The thief, the world, the flesh, and the devil, comes only to steal and to kill and to destroy. I have come so that they may have life and may have it abundantly. And he's not talking about being rich. 
He's referring to the same life that he promised the woman at the well. It's an abundant life because it's a life of contentment, a life of purpose, of having more than enough in all areas and knowing your reason for living. Because what good are riches without friends or without peace or without contentment or without purpose? The abundant life is not a life of riches. This is not a prosperity gospel. The second thing it is not, it is not a happily ever after gospel. In fact, Jesus never promised that we would be happy all the time or that nothing bad would ever happen. In fact, he promised quite the opposite in John 16, 33. He says, I have told you all this so that you may have peace in me because here on earth you will have many trials and sorrows. But take heart because I have overcome the world. In this life, you will... Hey, that's right. Good clapping there. How about everyone clap? Make her feel better. Yeah. (laughs) We'll get better at this, I promise. Jesus doesn't offer happiness, which is dependent on external circumstances. Jesus gives us joy, which is not dependent on external circumstances. It's, It's there inside of us, despite what's going on around us. Because in fact, we will have trials. We will have sorrows. If you are a true follower of Christ, it is not necessarily an easy road. Because there's a world out there that doesn't want you to succeed. But take heart because Jesus has overcome the world. So that's it. That's the vision. That's what we will be about from this day forward. As We will be focused on this one thing. This will be our one measuring stick is that our lives being changed. It's good to have salvation statistics. It's good to have all these other things. And I want people to get saved because a big part of life change is you got to get Jesus first. Am I right? But there's more after that. There's more after that. There's, there's, There's changes that have to take place. So we will be a church that is focused on one thing and one thing only about seeing lives changed, about seeing lives restored, about seeing the lost become found, about giving hope to the hopeless, about making the broken become whole, about making the desperate find that joy that we talk about, about the troubled finding the peace that passes understanding and finding people that are so bound up so in chains in in the things of this world and setting them free by the transforming, restoring power of Jesus Christ, our Lord and Savior. Let's pray. Father, I just, I thank you for giving me the courage to speak this today. I thank you for this vision. I thank you for changing my life so fundamentally that... (laughs) I even think about being up here preaching it just (laughs) how did that happen Lord you're the only explanation and so many people in here Lord you've touched in such a unique way you've changed their lives in a way that they could never explain and I just pray with all of my heart that you set our hearts on fire as a church that we will we will buy into this vision that we will understand that we will grasp your mission on this earth which is to restore what was broken in everyone, and everyone that we can reach. And in doing so, you'll change our lives as well. And I just pray that as we move forward with this vision and the mission and, and, and the things the next few weeks, that you just you stir our hearts as a church so that we become a place, a body of people that gets this, that wants to see this happen, because this is what you want, Lord. And I thank you for that. In Jesus' name, amen. Amen, amen. All right. So that's the vision. I got a few things to announce to you now, so hold on to your seats just for a minute. So because there's a lot of changes and stuff coming up, I want to kind of keep you updated on some of the things that are going on. So first of all, like I said, today was the vision, the the where we're going part of the road sign. The next two weeks, don't miss it, I'm going to be talking about how we're going to do that, the practical application of what it's going to mean to you individually as you're part of this family. And then the, the week, two weeks after that, I'm going to talk about core values, uh, which I think you'll actually like, I hope, anyway. Um, so anyway, don't miss it, and if you do, please watch it online. And one of the things to remember is that what I've been talking about, the short version of all of that is this idea of together, together. So it doesn't work if we're all separated. All right. Some other announcements. First of all, I want to inform you before I tell you all these crazy things that I do have an advisory team. (laughs) It's not just me up in my ivory tower or at my office with too much coffee making up stuff. 
All right, this is not how this works. I have a group of seven people besides myself. I'm going to introduce you to all of them on June 7th because they're all like traveling the next few weeks. So I wanted to make sure that they were all here at the same time. So on June 7th, which is a few weeks from now, I'm going to bring them all up on stage. You'll get to see who they are. But these are the people I meet with, that I make decisions with, that are that influence me, and they hold me accountable to make sure we do wise things as a church. They're all godly, spiritual people. Um, and I also have a finance committee. And on June 7th, we're going to be doing a budget, a church-wide budget meeting where I'm going to show you, we are going to show you what our church budget looks like. Not during the service, it'll be after service, you can come if you want to, you don't have to. But it'll be your opportunity to not only see where the money goes, but you have a say. You can ask questions, you can bring up comments. Now, it's not a vote like you're approving it, but if you do bring up something that we haven't thought of, we're going to go back and look at it. So it's your chance to have a say, to be able to speak into what it is we as a church are doing with the money that you give. Okay, so uh, also next week I have a very big announcement, so uh, I'm not going to do it today because I already have a million things to talk about. Uh, and Many of you might already know about it because I announced it at the prayer time this morning, and I'm sure it'll get through the rumor mill before <laughs> next week, but that's okay. Next week, a big announcement that you're going to be very happy about. Um, Another thing, a lot of people have been asking about small groups, small groups. Um, as you probably noticed, we didn't have small groups this past you know, months when we normally would, and it had a lot to do with the big transition we're going through, and it, there's a lot of administration that goes in with setting up small groups. But the official launch of the next, we're going to be kind of redefining how we do small groups a little bit. We want to have a varied sense of it, but we're going to launch it officially in the fall, September, mid-September. We're actually all going to go through a book as a congregation, as groups together. We're going to go through something all together. Um, but between now and then, if you are wanting to, uh, this summer, uh, late June, we're going to go through a series that if you want to form a group, now I know summer's hard, this is why we don't do it typically during the summers because everyone's traveling and all that kind of thing, but if you're going to be here and you want to commit to a group, you will have that opportunity to do uh, in mid-June. In between now and then, be thinking about if you would be interested in leading or hosting a group at your house. So I'm going to mention this probably almost every week. We're going to put it out on Facebook and everywhere else. I don't want to surprise you with it last minute, but come September, please consider hosting a group in your house and or leading a group, which simply usually means you kind of facilitate the discussion, that kind of thing. So just consider that. And then finally, I have a really, really, really big, huge, ginormous, gigantic announcement that will make you forget everything else I just said. <laughs> and it is, it's hopefully made it around the rumor mill because I started spreading it like weeks ago on purpose. But in case you haven't, here it is officially. We don't have a firm date on this, but we are moving out of this movie theater. Very good. <laughs> At least some of you are happy. That's good. Now, in case you're not convinced, I want to give you some of the reasons why. Um, first of all, I want to say that the manager, Mike Kennedy, is an amazing guy. I had lunch with him just the other day. Yes, yeah, very much so. I uh, love the man to death. He's a Christian, and he gets it. He understands the, the changes that have happened. Um, so he understands, and he's going to be very flexible with us as, as we're making these changes but, you know, I'm probably going to bring him up on stage one, our last Sunday here, hopefully. And I, I just want to honor him because he's done so much. He let us install spotlights in the ceiling. He hung a banner in the, in the lobby. I mean, he's been super flexible with us up until recently when he couldn't be anymore. So that brings me to some of the changes. Now, the recliner seats are kind of nice. Some of you like to recline in them. Like people like my wife, they're too short to sit on them and that kind of thing. But the big deal, you know, even though they're nice, it reduced the seating capacity in here from almost 400 to 165, and we don't even use the front row, which is like 20 seats, so really it's like 155. So right now, we're sitting in like 110, 120 people. This is like full. You know, people don't like to sit next to each other, that kind of stuff. So the truth is we, we're already kind of cramped, even though it doesn't feel like it. Also, um, this front area is a lot smaller. This stage is like a you know two-thirds the size we used to have before. This is why we have to move stuff around all the time, and they... It put in carpet and stuff, makes it harder to set up, that kind of thing. Also, because of the movies happening at the same time, we have far much more restricted areas. Like, we can't use the hallways, we can only store stuff in the theaters we're using, and then it costs a lot. 
You know, we can't do anything after church. We'd have to pretty much tear down and get out. So not that you needed a whole lot of convincing, obviously, but it's, it's simply, it used to be good, but now it's not, and we need to go. So the question is, where are we going? Well, I don't have this officially approved. So this is what, <laughs> I'm giving you notice now, and it may change. Hopefully not. I have faith that this is where we're supposed to go. Um, but again, I don't have it officially approved yet. I'll keep you posted. <laughs> but the goal is to move to Green Run High School. Green Run High School. I mean, some people are happy about that, yeah. <clears throat> now, uh, I have a map. You want to show that? Yeah, so Green Run High School. We're over here, Regal Cinemas. It's up there, a little bit more centrally located. It's about, um, what is it, 7.6 miles if you go down Nemo and stuff. So anyway, it's, it's a little bit further from here. I know some of you are like, yeah, it's like across the street from my house. But for me, I live like way over there. It's a little farther from me. I'm willing to sacrifice. Um, so it's less than eight miles from here. It's more central to the populated areas of Virginia Beach. Uh, it has a larger facility. It has about 800 seats in the auditorium. 800. You know what that means? We might never have to go to two services. Yeah. Ever. <laughs> Maybe. Yeah. It would be nice for some, except for the setup team, just saying. Um, but we'll cross that bridge when we get there. Anyway, it'll be a while before we have to. Um, also, it has a larger pre-built stage. Can you bring up that uh, picture. Sandy Martin, one of the guys on the advisor team, went and took some pictures. It's a little blurry, but it's, an, it's a school auditorium where they do plays and stuff, though. It's all built up for production. In other words, we won't have to put these things up here. We won't have to build this stage. We won't even need those spotlights. It'll all just be there. It'll be nice. Yeah, stud team's happy about that. Um, another thing, there's no time limit. Well, there kind of is. We've got to get out before school starts the next day. But, you know, there's really <laughs> no time limit. Um, and so we can do things after service. One of the things I really want to do, and I'll talk about this in a couple weeks, is I want to have to after church, like, pizza potlucks and meals and stuff so we can spend time together and not feel, like, rushed, like we've got to get out of here so fast every Sunday. So that's one of the huge reasons. We won't have moviegoers like, it's so confusing for the welcome team especially. Like, hey, new people. Oh, no, they're going to a movie. Won't have that. It's also a safer environment for children. It's bright. It's colorful. It's, it's, it's a school. It's designed for kids, that kind of stuff. And here's an even better part. It's half the cost. Yeah. Half. half the cost. Okay, so that's one of the big reasons. <laughs> costs a lot less. Anyway, I'm excited about it. Right now, the pictures you see is because Coastal Community Church currently meets there. They built their own building. They're supposed to move out June 7th, and this is where some of the flex comes in. The goal, the hopeful, the pray, please, if you will, is I want our last Sunday in the theater here to be June 14th, which is a month from now. June 14th. And then the following Sunday is June 21st, which is Father's Day. This we're definitely, whether we're here or not, we're going to have church at the KOA campground followed by a cookout right after service. So we won't even be here at all on Father's Day. We'll be doing the whole service out at the KOA campground, and then we're going to have games and fun stuff for Father's Day and all that kind of stuff. You know, maybe next year I've thought that we'll do pictures on Father's Day and on Mother's Day do the cookout. I don't know. Like, why do we do it that way? Maybe we'll just do cookout for both. Hey, I like food. Um, <clears throat> so the KOA uh, campground at Father's Day, and then the goal is the following Sunday, June 28th, would be our first Sunday at Green Run High School. Um, like I said, this is all in very wet cement. I'm not even, I don't even have the school technically approved yet, except for like the word of like, hey, yeah, it'll get approved kind of thing. I don't have the paperwork. Uh, Coastals, they keep pushing their date back or when they're getting out of the... So it could change. I don't know. We'll keep you posted, but I wanted to let you know now because the earliest, and if it does happen that way, is we'll be out of here after June 14th. Um, another cool thing about that is uh, that Coastal Communities is selling us their huge like U-Haul truck and like 15 of these rolling carts for a ridiculously good price. Um, and they just offered it to me. I didn't even ask. So God's definitely opening doors. I'm excited about what we can do over there. And ultimately, the whole purpose of all this is so that we can start being a family as a church. We won't be restricted 
But, you know, the theater was nice at first, but the changes that have happened just make it not possible to carry out this vision and the mission that I'll talk about the next couple of weeks of doing life together and things like that. It just doesn't work here, and so we got to go. we got to move, and I, don't, I haven't heard anyone be upset about it yet, so I'm happy about that. So anyway, that's all I have for you today. You'll, like I said, hopefully you'll remember at least some things I talked about. Watch it online. Uh, there was some audio issue with the talk last week I'm trying to figure out. But um, anyway, uh, you got another three minutes before you're supposed to pick up your kids, so feel free to hang out in here or elsewhere and chat with each other. God bless. Thanks. <laughs>